All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, early October 1776, Benjamin Franklin has just been named the first American diplomat by the Continental Congress and is preparing for a trip to France. Franklin was 70 years old, very much an elder statesman of sorts at this point. And I don't know, sometimes we think about these late career diplomatic appointments as cushy gigs like, hey, your new job is to go to Paris and attend fancy dinners. <laughs> and there is a little bit of that in this story, as we will discuss. But of course, this is 1776. Revolution is in the air. The ink has barely dried on the Declaration of Independence. And France is a key ally in the fight for American independence. So let's talk about why Franklin goes to France just as war is breaking out at home. Our very special guest for this episode is Mike Duncan, history podcast royalty, I would say, the host of a number of epic history series, including the History of Rome and the Ongoing Revolution series, each season or installment of which tells the story of a different revolution from England and Haiti and Russia and Mexico, and yes, the American Revolution, which he did back in 2014. And this is a long bio, Mike. (laughs) He's done so much. His book is Hero of Two Worlds, the Marquis de Lafayette in the Age of Revolution, um, which is very relevant to what we're discussing today. But Mike, mm-hmm. thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I just want to be clear that I'm I'm a Republican, small R Republican. So like I reject being podcast royalty. Um, you know, I don't believe in, in aristocracy of the blood or any of those things. So oh, um, we must make our own citizen based Republican. Yeah podcasts. Uh, okay, yes, I appreciate that spirit. Um, and that voice you hear, of course, is Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hey there. <laughs> and Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt is not here. Just a scheduling thing. Life happens, folks. You can't, you can't, she couldn't make it. But we're very excited to, to do this. And um, I should also point out that uh, Mike is on tour this, this month as well. And we'll talk about that a little later. But depending on when you hear this, there's a decent chance he'll be in a town near you. So go check it out. Um, but Mike, I know you wrote this book that is about, you know, your guy, Marquis de Lafayette, and sort of you have that. So you have that perspective about, you know, one of the people that Franklin meets when he goes to to France. But I went back and listened to the episode you did in 2014 about this time period, you know, the fall of 1776. And you point out that there's a bit of an open question in, you know, in America about what exactly we want out of the war you know there's still this idea of like is it full independence or do we want to just extract some concessions from the king and so can you just start there about kind of like how open the questions were and especially as it pertains to ben franklin like where's his head at as he heads over to france well yeah i think it it was less of an open question by the time franklin is going over there than before there had been you know all through 73 74 75 and into 76 you know there's a very there's a very lively debate about what the point of all this is what what even the point of taking up arms is because yeah. even after the war started okay. was this meant to be uh, we need concessions from uh, the people who we would continue to be our sovereign and the parliament or are we going to break off and, and do independence Uh, But by the end of 1776, I think that at least among the colonial elites, 
the idea was we're going for independence now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where his head was at when he was going to France. And they realized, you know, Dickens, like, so John Dickinson is one of the major grandees of this, of this time period. And he's in the second continental Congress. And he's the one who's leading sort of the, the anti-independence movement. Yeah. He's the one who's making the very reasonable case. What are we going to do? Take on the entire British empire and win. <laughs> that's not, that's not reasonable. Um, and you guys are kind of crazy to be pushing us in this direction. I think it's going to lead to our, our collective downfall. Um, but they knew they were not going to be able to pull this off without bringing France into the war. Uh, they needed French money. They needed French arms. They needed French uniforms and boots and coats. They needed the French Navy. Um, and this was something that was of absolute paramount importance. And I believe that, you know, there, there's a way that the American War of Independence ends with American independence absent France, but it is a very long 30 year mm -hmm. 40 year long guerrilla struggle that's taking place up in the Appalachian mountains rather than a sort of uh, what we would consider a quicker and more decisive war uh, that played out because we got the French Navy. And once we got the French Navy, uh, things started going better for us. Yeah. I think oftentimes we don't talk enough about the relationship that the United States has with the French and that how our statesmen, people like Thomas Jefferson, who's a huge Francophile, and Benjamin Franklin, who's also over there sort of, you know, schmoozing with people and loving the culture and, um, you know, developing these relationships. Uh, these relationships become pivotal in terms of how we think about the construction of the nation and the ideas that spring forth from those cultural connections, too. Yeah. And, you know, it was it's as I wrote in Hero of Two Worlds, there's there's at least one sentence in there uh, where it is just the absolute strangest of bedfellows <laughs> that gets made in this war of independence, because you're talking about a bunch of colonial, you know, uh, Protestant Anglo farmers and merchants who are going to ally with these French Catholic absolutists and all through the colonial period, you know, when when Europeans started showing up in North America, the conflicts between, uh, you know, the Anglo population sort of in the in the mid-Atlantic region and the French populations both up in Canada and down in the Caribbean, those were the central conflicts mm -hmm. that, the, that the colonists face and that, the, and that the two respective empires recognized, the French and the British. They were just coming out of the Seven Years' War, mm -hmm. um, which was a huge war between the French and the British and all of the colonists obviously considered themselves British at the time. And so there was, you know, even when Franklin is going over there, you know, they're doing this, the people in the second continent of Congress, I mean, they're doing this very much on the sly because there's a popular opinion is not necessarily going to be thrilled about the notion that we're getting into bed with the French. Yeah. Um, and there were, there was a lot of uh, talk, especially up in Boston, that if we go ally with the French, that we will simply be trading one set of colonial masters mm -hmm. for another, and that we will, we will simply come under the French, French auspices uh, and not actually have the independence that they sort of wanted at the time. But when two people share an enemy, yeah. we know that the enemy of my enemy becomes yeah. my friend. And so, the, and there were, I mean, there were people in France too that were like, what are you talking about? We're going to go help these Republicans <laughs> like overthrow their king. Like, I don't want to do that. That seems silly. But everybody saw a golden opportunity to stick it to the British. And if you get a golden mm. opportunity to stick it to the British, you go and you do it together. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, I, I, part of what you're implying here is like, there aren't that many, if you go casting about for an ally, there aren't that many choices at this point. <laughs> and so, no, that, that was, uh, I mean, that was it. It was, it was, it was really, it was France or bust right. because, you know, like, uh, you know, the Spanish, you know, they were, uh, no, I mean, we certainly needed Dutch money, you know, and that was another thing. Like there was there was heavy lobbying um, uh, of the Dutch banks to get us loans, which was also really, really important. Um, but, yeah, it was it was France or bust, I think, in terms of winning that war the way that we did. Yeah. And, you know, well, one other interesting thing here is there, there was also a debate, I think, clearly settled at this point. But about the order of operations here, do you reach out to France in order to then give yourself the ability to declare independence and sort of feel like you're on solid right. footing? Or do you declare independence, kind of show what you're up to, and then reach out for help? And obviously it worked out largely that, you know, Franklin doesn't go over until after the Declaration of Independence. But, you know, that was an interesting open question as well, tactically. Yeah, and that was that, and that was one of the main arguments around independence yeah. is, is when do we do it and why do we do it? And they ultimately decided we need to go to France 
as uh, something that is a sovereign and independent thing, at least in its own self-conception, uh, and have them sign a treaty with us rather than than go begging in a way that is like this. We're still recognizing this as an internal conflict within the British Empire, which I think would have been more difficult for the French to sell themselves on the idea of interfering in the internal affairs of, of the British Empire openly. They were very happy to do it under the table yeah. <laughs> and they were doing it under the table forever like before like before franklin even comes like franklin is coming over um partly on the invitation of secret meetings that had gone on between right. the french and the, the and the that congress he was part of uh or he had, he had yeah that he over, was absolutely yeah. part of yeah mm, um a little more on that if you know you know and then i want to s- sort of spin the camera around and look at it from the french perspective but you know what is your sense of why Franklin ends up being the main diplomat here? I mean, you know, part of me is just kind of like because he's the only one who's over the age of 26 or whatever. And he has a little bit of that. <laughs> uh, uh, I know. But, you know, yeah. that also comes with that. Even considered oh, for, yeah. <laughs> in the colonial yeah. times. <laughs> but that also comes with baggage, too, because, I mean, you know, I think he really had some British loyalty just because of yeah. his age. Right. But I'm curious, kind of just Franklin as a figure, if you can paint a picture of why he was the one charged with this, you know, obviously very important task. He's, you know, I would not go so far as to say he's the only American who could have pulled this off. I do think that there were other people in the movement who probably could have done it. But Franklin is just he's the only one that anybody knows over there. You know, he's he's a world famous figure. Um, And at that moment, if anyone in Europe knows anybody in America, it's just the one guy and it's Ben Franklin. And he is worldly, you know, and he is savvy and he is cultivated and cultured and he knows how to work a room. He knows how to speak to the people. He knows how to speak to the elites. Um, And so him coming, you know, the, the very fact of his arrival in France is a cultural moment in France. And he, of course, we all know this, like he plays into this like so much that he's wearing around the beaver skin cap and he's he's acting like he's coming out of this uh, this like Republican Arcadia that is out there, some some utopia. And it, like many Europeans, we, we have this like this myth of the noble savage, right, which is something that is usually applied to the indigenous populations of North America. But at the time, especially in France, that myth of the quote unquote noble savage, they were including the colonists Mm. in that Mm. in that conception and so like they saw the americans as potentially something that was uh, they were untouched Mm. by by the corruption and the decadence of old europe and that they were they were coming out of this sort of pristine utopia and franklin is somebody who absolutely knew how to lean into that so much and play into it because he was you know he's like an enlightened merchant you know he is not (laughs) you know he's not coming out of uh the wilderness but that, I think that's what it is, is that when Ben Franklin's name and his mm-hmm. image is something that is so well known that it it gives the the colonial cause uh, legitimacy in a way that I don't think anybody else gives it legitimacy. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make. He is a celebrity in his day. And so the idea that people want Very much. to see him and meet him and have access to him in this way, I think is really powerful and provocative you know i think people are also curious as to figure out what he has to offer or what you know what sort of relationships could develop so yeah yeah and if if and like you say if there's if there's a dinner that's being Mm. held and ben franklin is on the guest (laughs) list then like you're getting people flocking to that dinner and he now he now has access to everybody um in a way that like you know there's a guy like henry lawrence who he's john lawrence's father um, you know, maybe he had the chops to do this on like a diplomatic level, but like, is, <laughs> you know, is it, yeah, if Henry Lawrence is, is coming to dinner, yes. are you getting all of Paris society showing up? No, you're not, man. You want to see you want to see Franklin and his and his silly, you know, coonskin cap. Right. Um, and, you know, Franklin, for his part, seemed to obviously really enjoyed uh, these dinners, oh, yeah. you know, and he took part. Um but yes, I mean, he inspired, you know, there, his face was appearing on jewelry and on medallions and on there were statues. And then he seemingly inspired a women's hairstyle that people were started doing their hair a la Franklin. Um, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but, you know, um, yeah. And so so let's do that thing where, you know, you obviously write the book about Marquis de Lafayette. Um, is there a moment where, you know. Ben Franklin comes sauntering into the room and is there a relationship there and what's that like? Oh yeah, Franklin Franklin and Lafayette wind up having a very good relationship. Um but they they miss each other the first time. Uh when Franklin comes over, he he is in Paris by before Lafayette gets on his own ship and leaves for what is going to become the United States. 
Uh, but Lafayette is in the process of like running away from home and dodging orders from the king not to leave France. So he wasn't he wasn't making too much contact with anybody. So he gets Lafayette leaves France just as Franklin is arriving. But when Lafayette gets to France, he is this rich 19 year old noble who is telling people, I'm a marquee. I have come to join the Continental Army. Um, I have a signed uh, commission here from Silas Dean that says, I'm a major general in your army. Will you please recognize this? And when he arrives in Philadelphia, he like they just show up on him, him and some of these other French officers that he was traveling with. They just show up unannounced in Philadelphia and literally go knock on John Hancock's door and say, hey, we've got these commissions from Silas Dean, your representative back in Paris. You got to make me a major general. And they're looking at him. They're like, you're, you're just some 19 year old kid. We don't really believe you. We're certainly not going to make you a major general. We would like you to please leave now we don't need you around um and l- then they and like almost literally slamming the door in his face I, hancock sent him down to robert morris and said go go talk to morris i don't want to talk to you what gets lafayette's uh what gets lafayette into the army is then a letter arrives from franklin mm. adre- one, one address to the continental congress and one address directly to george washington saying look there's this teenage marquis who might be showing up on your door (laughs) he's friends with the king and queen he knows the foreign minister Mm. he is connected to the most powerful families in france we need to in effect an alliance with the kingdom of france and this kid is a direct living link to all those people Mm. he knows them personally so let him into the army give him whatever he wants and then there's a great line in there it's like i'm paraphrasing now but it's basically for the love of god don't let him get killed (laughs) because if he dies if he dies we're screwed (sighs) Like this kid has to be protected at all costs. And that's what that's why Lafayette gets into the army. Mm. You know, he's there because of his political and his social connections back to the back to the court of France. And nobody thinks he's going to do anything. They think that he's just there. He's just some rich kid having a lark in the Mm. woods um, and that he'll he'll have his adventure and then he'll go back to France. Nobody really took Lafayette seriously until Lafayette started showing that he was much more than that and wanted much more than that. He wasn't just there to have an adventure and go back that he was that he was a serious soldier and considered himself to be a serious you know political figure on the make but that's what gets him in Mm. is a letter from franklin talk about a letter Mm. of recommendation i mean (laughs) (laughs) yeah which 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 let's be clear franklin wrote a lot of these many of them were just full of lies right like (laughs) like like the things he's writing for von steuben none of it's true but franklin's got an eye for town the the so the letter that he wrote about lafayette was true Mm. uh and then so so Lafayette serves in the army for about a year and a half. And then there, the, the war hits a bit of a doldrum. And, I, and it does become time for Lafayette to do the thing that everybody expected him to do, which is then return to France and use his experience, tell his stories um, and gin up excitement for the alliance between France and America. And so when he returns to Paris um, during this period, this is when he actually does hook up with with Franklin and the two of them spend you know close to a year in very close contact, you know, meeting, meeting regularly with each other, meeting regularly with ministers, you know, sort of concocting they they, Franklin and John Paul Jones and Lafayette dreamed up a scheme to have them raid the British coast to try to hold the British Navy um, uh, closer to the UK, as opposed to like letting them travel across the Atlantic. They uh, there's a great thing in, and I got from Laura Arikio's book, the Marquis reconsidered, which is a really good biography of Lafayette. Um, that there was a there was a children's book that Lafayette and Franklin collaborated mm, on. Huh. That was like, sort of sort of like an ABC like and with but it would it would depict the horrors and atrocities of the British. Mm. Wow. And you know it was like you know it was like E is for execution, <laughs> all the people that the British execute. You know like those kinds of things. And then like and then like woodblock wow. prints of like you know the British doing these horrible like war crimes, um, just as a fun piece of uh, wartime propaganda. Uh, wow, wow. <laughs> is this where the two of them sort of come together? Together in terms of their abolitionist ideas, because I know that Franklin owned um, enslaved people as a young person, and as mm-hmm. he gets older, you know, he he frees the slaves. He takes a much more staunch abolitionist stance towards the end of his life. But I wonder if they're also having conversations about how they think about the institution of slavery, which is interesting too, because France has slaves, Great Britain has slaves, the United States, Mm -hmm. everybody has slaves in the new world. Um, But this idea of abolition is also in the air alongside, you know, the enlightenment and liberty and freedom and equality and all of these things. How much is that circulating between the two of them? It's it's hard to imagine they didn't talk Mm -hmm. about it. 
Um, it just is, it's hard to imagine, you know, um, on John, Colonel John Lawrence, uh, if you know the Hamilton musical, he's mm-hmm. one of Hamilton's close friends and probably a little bit more than that. Um, but Lawrence was an abolitionist too. And Lafayette was in close contact with him for a long time. And he's in close contact with Franklin. Um, during the war period, you know, all the correspondence that I see from Lafayette doesn't speak too much of him yet having any kind of enlightened opinion mm-hmm. about, about slavery or the slaves. But in 1782, just a year after the war is over, he is by that point writing letters to Washington saying, you know, we have won this war for liberty. And so it is time to move on to the the next obvious step in that project, which is to free the slaves. We need to get going on on emancipation because liberty and slavery are incompatible uh, ideas with each other. And one of the things that I that I sort of say about Lafayette is, uh, you know, I, I never found him to be a towering genius. Um, you know, he, he is in a world with people who are towering geniuses. You know, he's, he's, he knows Napoleon, he knows Robespierre, he knows Thomas Jefferson. Those guys are towering intellects. And Lafayette was, was a bright guy, but he was never a towering intellect. And so he was never quite able to hold these two ideas of liberty and slavery in his head at the same time. Like if we did liberty, that means we have to get rid of slavery, right? And his friends among the Virginia plantation owners uh, who were maybe a bit smarter than him, were able to compartmentalize these yeah. two ideas and say, yes, we did fight a war for liberty. And it's and it's great that you think that we should move on to slavery, but it's very complicated and it's hard mm-hmm. and we can't do it right now. Um, and all those things that you hear. So Lafayette's own connection to the abolitionist movement begins when he's still he's still in his early 20s. It's but it's after the war. And I would assume I didn't see anything, you know, coming out in the primary source documents that say, hey, I was talking to Franklin and we chatted about slavery. And he was like, this is crazy. We should stop it. And I was like, I agree. So I didn't see anything like that. (laughs) No, because at the time, I mean, this is what 1790 Franklin has this petition where he's writing about this great inconsistency, this great hypocrisy, and basically saying like, we need to, just as you said, we need to deal with this. We need to make the next step of emancipation. And I mean, it takes hold in the state of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania becomes, you know, this beacon of a free state and really an abolitionist stronghold into the 19th century. But it wasn't like Simon says. It wasn't like something where yeah, the rest of yeah. the colonies and, or states take that on. And and Laf- and Lafayette was there by the by the mid seventeen eighties. You know, there's a very great set of letters between him and John Adams mm-hmm. when John Adams was the ambassador up to England, saying, "I want you to send me a crate of books. I want you to send me everything that's ever been written about slavery and abolitionism because I'm going to make myself an expert on this subject because I think this is the next thing that we need to do." And he's saying, like, you know, if if I was to look at what's going on over there. Like I'm ashamed at the, mm. that the actions of the white race towards the black race is, is the way that he's, mm. you know, the language that he's using at the time. So Lafayette is there by the, by the mid 1780s and stays there until he dies in 1834. Mm. Yeah. Well, luckily, you know, everyone has a very settled and nuanced understanding of the American revolution as it pertains to slavery. And no one is trying to sure. like, politicize <laughs> that these yeah. days or do anything, you know, it's very really now, really. <laughs> Uh, but no, hold that thought because I actually do have a, a, a question about that for, for the end. Yeah. But to return to to Franklin, I mean, you know, so he, as you've been saying, he comes back to the United States with some evolved thinking about the, the, the slavery question. Um, he also comes back with a couple other things, um, including a snuff box filled with 408 diamonds that were gifted to him by King uh, by King Louis mm-hmm. um, and just in general, like a. A real appetite for the high life, it seems like. <laughs> um, which, fine, you're 70, you're on a diplomatic tour, you know, live it up. <laughs> but this does land him in a bit of hot water back home where um, people start to paint Franklin. It's this weird thing. Like, his his reputation only goes up and up and up, but then there's also a lot of sort of looking mm. at him as, this guy's a little, you know, playing it a little fast and loose. He might, some, you know, one of his fellow diplomats called him the most corrupt of all corrupt men <laughs> And um, these diamonds led to a whole emoluments clause thing, which, of course, came back roaring back in 2017 um, as a whole issue. But, um, you know, he, he he comes back and with a little bit of, um, I don't know, what do we make of his track record in, uh, in, scandal, in France, sort of? I suppose? Listen, you give me a yeah. box of diamonds, I'm keeping it. <laughs> I'm right. keeping it. <laughs> you, just, you, just re- you just retire from public life. You're like, if I'm not allowed to keep this gift and, and public career, then screw it, I'm out. <laughs> Um, I think I think a lot of that really has less to do with Franklin himself 
you know, and, and his particular actions then with the, with the ongoing and what, what is ongoing during the war and ongoing after the war, which is the division between sort of the Anglophiles and the Francophiles mm-hmm. yeah. um, inside the United States, where there were people that though, you know, I mean, Hamilton is one of them mm-hmm. that, that even though we're, we're fighting to break away from the British, ultimately like our commerce and our trade and our political institutions and our societies very much more align with the British than the French. And we don't want to become very, very close to the French. And Franklin is somebody who seemed to be to those people, like from the perspective of people who did not, who were very skeptical of French intentions, that Lof, uh, excuse me, that, that Franklin seemed to be selling the entire project of the United States to the French wholesale. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that we were just going to be living under the thumb of these French Catholic absolutists and that Franklin, far from not wanting that to happen, was like eager for it to happen and was probably being bribed to make that happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it, I think it has, like I said, I think it has less to do with Franklin's own actions than with this sort of like, where do we orient ourselves once we've won the mm-hmm. war? Was there yeah. a slight possibility that Americans might be speaking French? <laughs> we might be a bilingual <laughs> country after all. Right. <laughs> um and of course, you know, he secures some support, right? And I mean, I think at some basic level, he accomplishes what he was sent to do, which was to strengthen Oh, Franklin, uh, he country. absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah, he absolutely did what he went to do. And he, we didn't get sold out to yeah, the French, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know? Um, and so I think a lot of that was overblown. And then also many of the promises that the French had made to us uh, during the war about, about commerce, like that didn't come true either. Um, there was sort of a pulling away from both sides after the conflict. Yeah. Um, so yeah, n- none of the things that they were actually accusing Franklin of, of being and doing, like none of it was really particularly true. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, this has been really fascinating. And, you know, as we wrap up, I did sort of joke earlier about the kind of way in which some of these questions have come roaring back. But I wanted to ask both of you, um, I get to I get to be the one sort of asking the naive questions to people who actually know their history. <laughs> That's one of my favorite uh, things to do. But, you know, like, there is this conversation specifically about, you know, the revolution and what was it fought for and the slavery question and was the revolution the thing where we, you know, where Americans planted their foot and broke from slavery. And, you know, unfortunately, it's like contested and politicized in, in all these really dumb ways. But I'm curious, like in there, there is this attempt to paint the founding of this country as I see it as like sui generis and like this unimpeachable sort of moment of clear eyed values that can't be questioned. And now we can use that to sort of like paint a picture of American exceptionalism and so forth. And I mean, I wonder how much just like a simple acknowledgement of what we've been discussing here, that there was an exchange of ideas, Mm -hmm. that there were multiple different countries and multiple different schools of thought and that we were connected to the rest of the world. How much just that simple fact sort of complicates that story and adds Mm -hmm. a little bit of perspective. Well, I mean, a conception that I have formed that I didn't have before I started the Revolutions podcast, but I've now been at it for nine years. And I did multiple sort of revolutionary theaters during this particular period, especially this age of democratic revolution, is that I no longer believe that the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, Spanish American independence are sort of independent events Mm -hmm. that are separated from Mm -hmm. each other. I think it's really, it's one giant event that took place that sloshed both ways across the Atlantic. um, And that there is a huge amount of cross-cultural influence. Um, There's a huge amount of, you know, roles that are played like, like the United States goes on to potentially play the role of France when it comes to Spanish American independence. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Simone Bolivar is petitioning the U.S. government, like, I need your help to throw off the Spanish. And the United States refused to play the role that France had played for us. And we were not going to get into it. Um, And a lot of that is just because of, you know, national interest. Mm -hmm. And so now there's, you know, there's sort of the practical needs of now running this independent republic with the ideals that you're supposedly fighting for, which is this anti anti-colonial, um, uh, anti-colonial liberty and, and equality. So that that's where my head is at with that, that the United States of America as a thing is not this, uh, this unique beacon that grew sui generis out of the, you know, the, the forests of Arcadia, uh, here in the new world. It is, it is a project that was planted by one particular European power that was in contact and conflict with all the other European powers and that it grew out of a mixture of practical Mm -hmm. self-interest, improvisation, mistakes, you know, that it was geniuses doing works of genius, Mm. as opposed to human beings muddling along through very difficult Mm. periods, sometimes getting it right, sometimes getting it very wrong, sometimes being massive hypocrites, sometimes, yes, absolutely, 
setting a course that allows in the future for great accomplishments to be made and great progress to be made in terms of human rights, but which they themselves immediately started to resist. Mm. So the whole thing is just a giant, it's just a messy mess because it's human <laughs> beings doing things. There are um, no clear lines. And not, <laughs> no, there's, there's really not. Um, nobody comes out untainted. Mm-hmm. Nobody comes out um, you know, there's no perfect villains. Mm-mm. You know, I don't know if Jeff Jefferson's getting there a little bit, <laughs> um, but <laughs> oh, <laughs> just a little, just a little editorializing yeah. on the way out the door. <laughs> no, I think that's, I think that's spot on. I mean, I, I have to do this in my class all the time, where it's just like, it's complicated. I mean, that's the simple answer: is it's complicated, but yep. that like right. people are complex, and you can absolutely be an awesome military general and a slaveholder, right? Like you can be yep. you can be really thoughtful on the battlefield and really violent and horrific on your plantation. And those people occupied yep. the same space. And so I think we have to be able to tease out these identities. Even someone like Franklin, you know, who was a slaveholder and then pivots mm-hmm. and changes, who published mm-hmm. the advertisements for the purchase of slaves and published like abolitionist opinion pieces from Quakers like he did both so um it's never no pun intended but it's never black or white <laughs> yes mm-hmm. yeah. and he did that like a good merchant <laughs> yeah, <should. I> know. <laughs> <laughs> there's if you if you want if you want to know what it's the through line white, of those green. things are no <laughs> I'm, yeah. no yeah I'm so green and gold, I'm so, green cynical, and gold. Sometimes. I'm so <laughs> cynical sometimes I know but I was about to say like you know that's that's the satisfying answer is there's no tidy explanation but maybe you just did land on it it's just money <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah <laughs> um, but yes I mean thank you know thank you for both for saying that and that like but it is the case that like the idea that it's complicated just breaks some people's brains you know, <laughs> and they just can't and so we're all I know we're all trying to unbreak them as much as possible in, in our in our work and so you know Mike Thank you again for doing this. And of course, go read the book, Marquis de Lafayette. Go listen to all the podcasts. But then I mentioned you are on tour. When people are listening to this, uh, you will be out and about. And I gather you were just on a book tour, but this this series of shows in October, and we'll put a link to it in the show description and so forth, but this is doing something a little different, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I just wrapped up three weeks on the road uh, for the paperback release of Hero to Worlds, which was great. Mm-hmm. But in October, I'm playing uh, I'm playing Austin and San Francisco and Seattle. And then later in the month, uh, I'll be doing Boston and uh, Washington, D.C. and Newark, New Jersey. And this is a monologue piece that I have written and am going to be performing about uh, historical storytelling mm-hmm. and like narrative building, because I like as a species, what humans are is fundamentally as storytellers. Mm-hmm. And that's how we relate to each other. It's how we identify ourselves in the world. It's how we, it's how we communicate about the places that we've been and and who we are as people. But when we, when you meet people for the first time, we're mostly engaging in acts of historical storytelling. Mm -hmm. Where did I go to school? Where did Mm -hmm. I grow up? Who my family is, Mm -hmm. these kinds of things. And we do this for the societies that we live in too. You know, we just did it a bunch here today. We're trying to tell more complicated stories about what the American revolution meant or what the French revolution meant, but figuring out the societies that we live in and what they mean comes from these acts of narrative storytelling. And so we treat that as sometimes just a subgenre of literature or a subgenre of the discipline when really what it is, is how our brains organize all of existence. Uh, <laughs> and so I will, so I will spend, in, you know, in it's, 90 it's, tidy minutes. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, it's, it's a 70, it's, it's a tight, it's a tight 75. I love it though. It's the greatest pitch so, for history I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a tight 75 on, uh, on the, the meaning and nature of historical storytelling. Oh, there you go. That's great. And, uh, yeah, like I said, you know, I'll put a link in the show description, but I feel like what people are going to, you're just going to Google it. So it's called Mike Duncan, the stories of history. You'll find it. Yeah. It's coming to a city near you. Boston, um, yeah. It's coming, yeah, coming near us <laughs> yeah. and coming to Boston. You coming to Boston? Boston? Come out to Boston. I'm at the, I'm at the Wilbur yeah. Theater. Help me sell some I tickets. I will, I will. Yeah. All right, awesome. All right. Well, Mike, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks a lot. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Radiotopia.